Hello and thanks for joining me again this week. I'm here in North Bethesda, formerly known as White Flint, to highlight the completion of a project to make the area more accessible and people friendly. The first shovels in the ground were in 2018 after years of planning. Today we have city blocks that are easier to navigate, sidewalks, underground utilities, street lights, landscape and stormwater management canals that are all upgrades over what we had before. This is important because the North Bethesda area is on the verge of huge growth. This is where the University of Maryland will locate its Institute for Health Computing. I was thrilled to see the agreement with them establishing this institute and this academic research site at the North Bethesda Metro Station will be a catalyst for development from the life sciences industry and other businesses that want to be close to the revolutionary work that will be done in data computing and artificial intelligence to bring treatments and cures faster to our patients. One of our planned bus rapid transit lines will run along 355 and have meaningful public transit options is critical to making the area accessible and of course it's good for the environment to keep as many cars off the road as possible. It's also critical for economic development and the state of transportation services is cited by business leaders as a major impediment to attracting economic development and we're no exception. We are looking at some exciting plans for the future of this area, which will be meaningful for the county and the state for advances in public science and public health. Sometimes our affordable housing problems seem daunting, yet they don't have to be. We just need the courage to act, and we have to act in a multitude of ways. We need to preserve our existing housing and avoid displacement of people who live here now. We don't want to price them out of the county. One important part of that solution is rent stabilization. This county is losing affordable housing units faster than we can replace them. And replacing them isn't enough. We need additional units to accommodate future growth. We need them now. We are building affordable units and we're working with affordable housing providers to preserve others, but it's simply not enough. In a typical development in the county, only 12 and a half to 15% of all the new units built are affordable but they're only affordable to a narrow band of incomes and almost no family-sized three-bedroom units are built at all. In the year 2000, the county had about 43,000 naturally occurring affordable units here. By 2020, that number was down to 22,000, and we're projected to lose another 11,000 in these next 10 years. These units didn't simply disappear. They simply became unaffordable because of rent hikes. That situation sets the table for two competing bills, both introduced at the County Council on Tuesday. As many of you know, I support the measure co-sponsored by council members Juwando and Mink, the one they call the Home Act. It limits rent increases to the county's voluntary rent guidelines, or 3%, whichever is lower. But it also allows for rent adjustments to help landlords keep up with costs of maintenance and allows for higher increases when their costs exceed the guidelines. In context, rents as an average in the county have stayed below 3% for many, many years. The alternate bill would legalize enormous rent increases, and those increases are not linked to an increase in building costs, which I think is crucial. In a year where cost increases are 4%, this alternate bill would allow landlords to increase their rents by 12%, far more than is needed to protect their profits. I will be discussing rent stabilization at an event this Monday evening. It is hosted by Montgomery County Renter Alliance from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Silver Spring Civic Center. I'll be joined on the panel by council members Juwando and Stewart, along with Renter Alliance Board Chair William Roberts and the University of Maryland Professor Michael Bodekin. Rent stabilization, the HOME Act, is a measure that's fair to tenants and to landlords, and it will help us address the long-standing affordable housing crisis and help us to stabilize our dwindling supply of affordable housing. I'm hopeful that the council will pass the bill and I look forward to signing that bill into law. I wanna share some other exciting news that helps our area to be seen as a leader in protecting companies from online threats. On Monday, I joined Maryland Secretary of Commerce, this National Assistant Secretary of Commerce, and NIST leaders in assigning a new agreement committing the county to this partnership with the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. 
Since its launch in 2012, the partnership has helped develop a blueprint for cybersecurity that every business in the nation should be using. As we renew this agreement, NIST leaders are doing more to reach out to small businesses. U.S. Deputy Secretary of Commerce Don Graves announced the launch of the NIST Small Business Community of Interest Program and Cybersecurity Connections Initiative. Both programs aim to help more small businesses with their cybersecurity plans. By allowing small business owners here in Montgomery County and nationwide to take advantage of pilot programs and new methods for tightening online security, it will help protect these companies from financial ruin. These efforts will come from the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence here in Rockville. The county's participation in the partnership will continue to be managed by the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. I'm extremely proud of our work with NIST. I believe a strong network of businesses protected from cybersecurity threats leads to broader advancement of our economic development goals. Our area is already seen as a leader in the life sciences industry and developing a talent pool for those jobs. There's no reason it can't become the top place in the nation for both categories in the future. Maryland's robust cybersecurity industry and talent should be a big driver in the federal government's decision to relocate the new consolidated FBI headquarters to Maryland. The forthcoming decision by the GSA to select either one of two locations in Prince George's County in Greenville, Belt, or Landover, or an alternative site in Springfield, Virginia is upon us. This week, County Council President Evan Glass and I co-authored a letter lending our full support to Prince George's County's bid to become the home for the FBI's new consolidated headquarters. There are many reasons why Prince George's County remains the best choice for relocation, including transit considerations and a savings of between a quarter and a half a billion dollars compared to moving the headquarters to Virginia. I stand with Governor Wes Moore, Prince George's County Executive Alsterbrooks, and our entire congressional delegation in supporting equitable regional growth. Selecting Prince George's County as the new home for the FBI helps our region and the state of Maryland to prosper even more. Let's hope the FBI headquarters lands next door. This week, I, along with every council member, sent a letter to the Maryland General Assembly in support of the Melanie Diaz Sprinklers Save Lives House Bill 1292. A majority of the older unprotected buildings throughout Maryland are actually in Montgomery County, so this House Bill has the potential to save lives here. This legislation is needed to prevent further tragedies and would improve safety standards for county residents. Plans for this change are already in motion with the state fire marshal putting this mandate in place by 2033. If passed, this bill would also codify this change into law so that all high-rise buildings will be protected by an automatic sprinkler system by 2023. It's currently in the House Rules Committee and should be released so it can be heard by the full General Assembly. I want to thank our Montgomery County delegates for their sponsorship of this bill. It is a necessary but not inexpensive requirement and we will need to work with the state and federal partners to find ways to help reduce the costs that could otherwise wind up displacing people. I'm also disturbed over reports I'm hearing that management of this building is forcing displaced tenants to sign waivers in order for them to recover their belongings. I don't understand how this is even legal and we're advising tenants who have been forced to sign or have been offered to sign the waiver to seek legal counsel. These tenants have been through enough already. They shouldn't be double victimized here. We will continue to monitor the situation. And I also want to thank all those who stepped up to help these tenants who have been displaced. Uh, over $40,000 has already been raised for their long-term needs. More than $7,600 was also collected and distributed last week for short-term issues like food for families unable to cook for themselves while staying elsewhere. Thank you to everyone who's contributed to this. Around our region and nation, law enforcement agencies are facing workforce shortages and MCPD is also having the same challenges. This week, I addressed our newest officers at the MCPD Police Academy graduation ceremony in Rockville. I expressed my congratulations and appreciation to the graduating cadets and their families. I expressed to the graduates that trust with our community is needed more than ever now. Our community can't thrive if they don't have faith in those who are here to serve and protect them. 
and our county can't make progress unless MCPD succeeds. I'm pleased that we were able to raise the starting pay for officers, making us more competitive with other jurisdictions in the region. This is the second class of new officers in the last seven months, and the addition of these new officers is going to help our staffing efforts. But we have to continue to attract and recruit more officers to our police department. As police departments elsewhere around the country, we are struggling to fill these vacant slots. A couple of weeks ago, we announced a $20,000 signing bonus for new recruits. That news turned a lot of heads and we immediately saw a tenfold increase in application interest. If you, a friend or loved one that you may know is interested in serving MCPD, they're having an open house at the County Police Academy in Gaithersburg this Sunday, March 12th, from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Attendees can tour the facility and ask questions of officers and the recruiters. In COVID-19 news, the community level remains low. We're starting to get a better timeline of when federal money will no longer provide some of the assets we've been able to use over the last few years. The latest example is the overflow hospital set up to help with COVID-19 patients that was at the old Tacoma Park Adventist Hospital. And Adventist has said that they will close that facility on April 28th. I urge you to remind everyone to continue to stay up to date on your boosters, vaccines and other protections. Health experts say anyone who hasn't received the booster shot since the new bivalent boosters were introduced in September should get one now. Montgomery County remains committed to being a source for vaccines, test kits and masks throughout the end of the fiscal year, the summer. Please visit montgomerycountymd.gov slash COVID-19 for more information about scheduling an appointment or finding a pharmacy or doctor near you that's offering boosters. Thank you again for tuning in this week, and I'll be back again next week with more news from your county.